Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Open Forum Podcast. Today we have with us Christy Grace. Christy is a consultant working in biotechnology with her background in recombinant antibodies, CRISPR technology, mRNA, gene synthesis and quality control. Now these are things that as I'm sure you can guess are very very relevant to what's happened in the last few years. Next to that uh, she's also working in clinical mental health counselling. She wears a fair few hats, to be fair to her. Now, Christy, welcome on the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And um, why don't you take two minutes, uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, and then we're just going to dive on in uh, about the experimental uh, medical products. Sounds great. Thanks, Sunny. Thanks for everybody listening in. Um, I'm in. I'm 47. I went to school later in life. Uh, married younger. I uh, decided to go back uh, over 10 years ago. I initially went to school to be a pharmacist. My first major was biology, and I got in the wait spot for pharmacy school for PharmD, doctor of pharmacy, and I got in an accident, sadly, out jogging, and I had to take a year and a half off. Then I got a de- just I didn't complete the PharmD, so then I, I got a degree in sociology involving community and environmental justice with public health disparities, human rights, and international law. Uh, maybe I wanted to be a human rights lawyer too one time. But then I, I I did the job that you said, um, you know, working with uh, with the largest plasmid company in the world. I started as a, a coordinator of the projects and the company was growing so quickly, working with RNA, liquid nanoparticle, and making recombinant antibodies, proteins, CRISPR, so many hats, like you said. Uh, it was because the company was growing so quickly they didn't have enough people to staff the position. So I started to learn aspects of shipping, aspects of, like you said, quality control. I worked with our lawyers, our third party vendors. I worked with small companies, large companies, and it was all custom production. So if a researcher wanted something made like a protein or a monoclonal antibody, uh, most of them don't make their own stuff. That's through the custom labs. And that's that's what I, I managed the projects and I designed them as well. And I'm, I really wanted patient interactions. So then I, I left that job and I went back into schools, grad school, uh, two different psychology programs, uh, one applied behavioral analysis. I was in there about uh, half the time and I decided I wanted to do, uh, that was with kids and autism spectrum disorder and I decided I wanted adults and more relationship stuff and attachment. So then I studied uh, clinical mental health counseling. But now I, I don't work for anyone. It's just me. So I'm consulting and I love doing both. So I've had researchers reach out, reach out to me on Twitter to help them with either long COVID patients or um, experimental product injured patients. So I, I can kind of give them some background knowledge of what they're dealing with because they're only seeing what's, I guess, on the, you know, the outside. So they don't have experience with the mechanisms where I produced those in the lab to know what was going on. So, and I love both. So then I also you know, volunteer, martial arts, jog. Thank you. Nice. Writing two books right now. So you, you, you're keeping busy. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that you mentioned there that I think are going to be very relevant as we crack on with the podcast. You mentioned uh, there was human rights law and that sociology degree that you did as well. And you are currently consulting on uh, a couple cases with regards to a particular medical intervention uh, and a case against the FDA and the US government. Uh, and then you're also uh, advocating and uh, consulting for a case for the those injured uh, by said medical products. So that's something that we're going to come into further on down the line. However, why don't we start from the start? Your background is with biotechnologies, mRNA, uh, recombinant uh, antibodies, and that kind of encompasses everything that's occurred, everything to do with a medical intervention. What is it about this intervention that's so different? And what is it about the process that has led to the manufacturing of this and the green lighting of this particular product that pricked your ears up in the beginning phases of of all this rollout and everything. Thanks, Sonny. You asked a a few questions. I want to answer the last one you asked first, which was um, how how it got approved so quickly or why 
Was that one of the questions? And what pricked my ears up? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I worked, I've got some props that we talked about that I have that I want to explain the processes too of what happens in the lab when you're making a protein, such as the spike protein under very controlled conditions. Now, the, the projects that I was designing, a researcher would reach out to the company I worked for. We had three different, there's three different sites where they would want uh, an antibody made. All antibodies are proteins, but not all proteins are antibodies. If you think of all apples are fruit, but not all fruit are apples. So they would have an idea in their head of something that they'd want produced, but they didn't know how to get there and they didn't know how to make it. So they would reach out to me and we'd have meetings and talk about how they wanted the final product to look like if you were making, baking a cake, uh, you know, they didn't have the recipe. They just knew what they wanted the end cake to look like, taste like, texture. But they had a little bit of the starting recipe, which is called the gene sequence. So when I worked with these projects, when it's, it's custom, um, it was for, you know, for the RNA, for the proteins, there's things I knew in my mind that happened in the lab that we would see as complications that we want to talk about in a little bit under very tight controlled conditions. And I thought about how, what would that look like in the human body? Because we had things go wrong in a lab where everybody with education and temperature and controls are held where it's all the same. And we still saw variations and complications. But when we did stuff with RNA, those were for very small groups of people, what we'd call small cohorts. And those were developed for clinical trials. I can't say the companies I worked for or with because of CDA for confidentiality, but if you've seen a breakthrough in the news, the company, the main company I was designing this for had a hand in it. So uh, like, like any main, like either genetic disease or other diseases, but the, the groups of people that were receiving RNA are people that don't have a choice. They are kids that aren't going to live long. They're adults. And the clinical trials prior to 2020 involving RNA was never in this big, massive production of automated stuff like where you see the vials coming down in the videos. That, absolutely not. They were hand, what pipetted, they were rigorously inspected, but it was for the kids that don't have long to live or just devastating disease because of the high risk of using RNA in the body because of what are called the off-target effects, effects and then all the other things that, you know, I'd love to talk to you about today for everybody listening. So like that was a thing that kind of, you know, bells went off and I wanted to believe that it was going to be helpful. Like, why not? Like when, because in the first, you know, the 20, beginning of 2020, we just saw, were there, were there like doctors taking their lives in New York? Like it was just so bad. And it was so bad. The images of people getting sick. So of course I wanted to work, but that's kind of what set, kind of set bells off. And it was kind of a process for me when I had to think about that was only made in the past for people who either have shorter lives or they're suffering a lot. And that's plan B because plan A isn't living long. So, and because of the high risk of the complications of using RNA with people. So that was, yeah, when they said they're going to give it to everybody. Like it, right away, it didn't register what that really meant. Okay. So uh, there, there's, there's a couple of things there. One, of course, is that the only times that the RNA was then given out was in these circumstances whereby if things went downhill, things were already going downhill. So right. it was much of a muchness at that point in time. And if there was a positive outcome, hey, ho, this is fantastic. Let's continue down this road. And if there was a negative outcome, it was kind of going to be negative anyway. It's unfortunate that it's gone this way, but we did our best. We gave it the good old college try. And unfortunately, this time it didn't work out. The other thing is you, you mentioned that there are certain elements, um, there are certain markers that have to be hit along the process in, in the production. And you mentioned that these things were pipetted out. 
uh, not, you know, vials and vials and a massive production line. Um, there have been issues in Japan uh, where they've noted that I believe with um, one of the larger manufacturers uh, had metal particulates found in uh, their production line due to the fact that some of this stuff was rushed out. But the things that have to be done as uh, sort of mileposts in the production of these um, therapies what are they and how long do they normally take because this went in around seven weeks into human trials right from from march to april uh, march to may so in seven weeks they managed to get through all the standard lab testing is that normal would you say for for that no. to happen no not at all no. It was uh, it was Pfizer that got in the United States the approval in March, and then it was by mid May of 2020, same year March of 2020, mid May, where they started. They announced they started human trials, but there, like you said, there's milestones that have to be met, even without extended trials, or like when you said before, you have a small group of people where the outcome isn't good anyways, but that you start with them. And then you, you keep expanding out. So even if you didn't do any of that stuff, just the pe preparation to get everything that's needed for those groups. Because for it, it, there's just, yeah, there's just not enough time. So did you, you want to talk about the milestones and how long it would take and what's involved? Yeah. And I, I guess like the, the great thing is like, I could uh, explain an example call. Like if you were a researcher calling me and let's say you wanted the spike protein made just this protein itself in the lab, not for people, but the actual protein. And you wanted it made in the lab. You would send, you know, we would talk about how long it would take, which we'll go into when you needed it by, you might tell me again, the specifics of, you know, what kind of levels for contamination. Cause there's all, there can be some depending on what you're doing, but it's usually really low, uh, like contamination, um, Endotoxin, for instance, usually don't get that with working with what are called mammal cells or mammalian cells. Because you can use bacterial cells, but that's not something you do with humans normally, which is like beyond the scope of like this. Like I want to keep it higher level here, but you you would have what's called a gene sequence, which is the instructions of the the protein you'd want to make. The, the central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to a protein. And when you do protein production, when, when we talk about recombinant, that means a combination of. So it's basically Frankensteining genetic material together in a way that it's not seen in nature. And then it's introduced into a cell in order to make a protein that's never been made before. So that's the word recombinant. Um, so if you were a researcher and you reaching out to me and we'd have a meeting and you'd tell me how much of this protein you'd want. And we'd start off with the, the gene sequence. And I, like we talked, I made little props. Like, so this is, this is the DNA. This is my little DNA. And usually you would see it like twisted there. And uh, the outsides are sugar. And then the insides are the base pairs. So I talk about DNA to RNA to a protein. DNA then goes to RNA. And this is the RNA, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. The DNA translates over to transcribes to RNA, and then RNA is going to go to protein. And there's the crazy spike protein. So what, what we would do with the company that I worked for, which raised the alarms for me when I, I thought about what what's going on here, you know, we would send the gene sequence. Uh, like a lot of people have talked about the gene sequence in Wuhan and the spike. We would send the gene sequence off to a company to what's called Grow It Up and something called codon optimization, which again, beyond the scope of this where people didn't really need to know. But then they would send back the, the RNA. And the RNA, you would need to get it into the cell because in the RNA, again, is the instructions to make a protein. So if you think about if you're gonna bake a bread and a bread maker, and you want the bread to be a certain taste and texture, this would be the ingredients going into the bread maker, two bread makers in the UK. No, we're talking to like a global audience. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. Like a bread machine? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I would be a bread maker, but like the bread machine where you put yeah, it in. Yeah, you put it in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you, know, you need to get that into the cell. And yeah, you know, this is like my little representation of a cell. It's not going to be perfectly circular, but like this is the what's called the phospholipid bilayer. And there's two layers that are smacked up against one another. And there would be channels, like little openings. To allow where passage things can into come the in. cell, yeah. Right, because you got a nucleus and you've got a, a bunch of other stuff, but this RNA has got to find a way to get in there and get into what's called the, the ribosome. So then, you know, scientists figured out, and Malone talked about this, that you, you need to put it in a liquid nanoparticle, which has got four parts. Here's my little nano bag. <laughs> so it's going to like, the RNA is going to be encased in lipid nanoparticle, pathetic, I know. But in, in this way, a lipid, you know, we always had a saying in science called like dissolves like. Like if you've ever poured oil on top of water that's boiling, the oil's not going to mix with the water like oil and vinegar, balsamic. So because this membrane, this is the outside of the cell, is made of lipids, and this is a lipid, plus there's four parts to it that are making it do extra special stuff like the pegylated, the positive, charged, and the cholesterol. It means that this is going going to go into a cell anywhere. It's just going to slip right in, like no matter what. So in the lab, once it gets into the cell and it's hanging out in the cell, it's going to get into what's called the ribosome and it's going to start making a it's bunch going to start of getting proteins. coded for and it's going to start making the proteins. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and so, so this, this takes time right, as well. It's it's not done uh, in the matter of 30 seconds. This all takes yeah. time to, like you said, you have to go through the code on optimization. Then you have to get the, the base pairing codes for the RNA. Then it has to be produced in the lab. Hopefully the codons are okay and there's no issues in the recombinant DNA that you guys have spliced together. Uh, so this all takes some time to do as well um how how long before we go any further how long is this process normally just sure. that so um, usually sending off and getting back is so uh, one to two weeks for sending off the gene sequence to you know they they do what's called flank it into a vector they flank it into a plasmid and then there's a origin of replication and some antibiotics involved but basically it's like growing up it's reproduced over and over again because you need you need enough RNA of it. Is a, yeah it's a physical it's a physical material you just can't see it so that's probably one to two weeks and then when you put it in the cells the cells start You're making the proteins it. and this is my little representation of the spike protein but then so we're going to make a bunch of these yeah and then you have to get it out of the cell so sometimes so that's another so that's called transfection when you get the RNA into the cell. And then it's gonna start making, making, making some. And sometimes, you know, in the cell, it either, it kicks it out. Sometimes it makes it inside the cell. Sometimes it kicks it out of the cell, the protein rather. Sometimes the cell, the protein will get stuck in the membrane. You've got to do things to get it out. But that's probably with the codon optimization, the, uh, the amplification of the gene of interest, which is basically, just, you know, getting the RNA made, that's the three to four weeks alone. And then you have to get the protein out of the cell and do what's called purify it. And that takes a lot of steps. And because you've got all these parts of the cell, like the nucleus and the mitochondria and all the things that are in the cell, you have to separate the spike protein from the rest of the stuff. So that's called, you're gonna isolate the protein of interest. So. The one way to do that is with a column, and and they're just uh, like a a cylindrical thing. I mean, it's it's almost like exactly like this, even though it's not cardboard. And what you do, like the inside, is either going to have little ledges where it collects things of different sizes. So the thing you want is going to like go out. So like, there's your little like bunches of cell parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe. Maybe you just want this one and you don't want, you know, the the little ones that are like, you don't want this. So you, there'll be different so things going on. So essentially the column will filter it out. We'll filter out what we want, we'll separate right. the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Right. I, there's things called uh, 
affinity chromatography where you can use metal, but never you do never do metal in a human. When you talk about Japan, you can never you can never use metal with humans, only animal studies. So then you put it through, you know, by size, that's called size exclusion chromatography, HPLC. There's a ion exchange, there's all these ways because you have to get, you know, even though there's like little, little balls here to represent, I mean, at the end of the day, you want this mm. all by itself and you don't want any bacteria on it. You don't want any, anything on it. So that's uh, another three to four weeks. So there so, we're already looking at six to seven weeks before anything's happened yet, before there's been any chance to experiment with the protein that's been produced. Well, there's more that has to be done. So it's yeah. usually eight to 10 weeks because then, I mean, so even though, like I know people have seen pictures of the spike protein and proteins look like just a like bunch of stuff here, mm. but there's, there's a method to its madness. So even though... It comes out looking like that, but uh, sometimes, you know, it might come out like that. And in a lab, you have to put it through what's called a two-step process with a buffer and a protein detergent to refold it in the way that it needs to go. And not just one protein, all of them. And so that's one thing that happens in a lab is what's called misfold. And that's with using the same equipment, the same chemicals. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's not uncommon for your protein to come out like that. Yeah. And that can obviously have an effect on the protein, on the protein's function, whether or not it's picked up by the body. So again, this is another phase in the process that if something goes wrong, it sets people back, it sets things back. So even if every step of the process everything went okay the first time around and there were no issues we're still over a couple months down the line and and 10 to 12 weeks yeah yeah. on average if and that's just moving at the physical speed of you know that's if you're just moving at the speed of i don't want to say it science because that (laughs) is the speed of science that is the speed of science (laughs) So it's eight to twelve, you know, eight to twelve weeks, usually ten on average, twelve. So yeah, two two months, two and a half months, just to get to know what happened in when you did the thing. So here's the thing, Sonny. So we could run a project that we did a month prior, the exact same thing, using the exact same cells. Usually the cells used are called human embryonic kidney cells or Chinese hamster ovary cells, called Hecker Cho because they they make a lot of protein they're an animal you don't want you don't usually use a bacteria to make a protein meant for a human but uh even the ovary cell versus the kidney cell can make different amounts of protein in different ways but we could replicate the same project a month later for a different company and get a different outcome because we had this saying that goes biology is going to do whatever biology is going to do And that's in a highly controlled lab under perfect very, conditions. Yeah. Well, stringent conditions. Stringent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, one of the other things that we spoke about was the lipid nanoparticle itself. And you recently released a Substack on this as well, on the issues that can occur with the lipid nanoparticles and, and the uh, PEG as well. And can you maybe talk to us about that? briefly yeah I'll to. um not the peg though i think that the pg has been hit really hard so lipid nanoparticle has four different parts uh, one is the pegylated another one is cholesterol that kind of helps bond it together uh, one is called ionizable and it's a cation lipid so it has a positive charge so i think if you think about magnets where there's a positive and a negative charge on each end that uh, that's that's what's going on with the lipid. It has a positive charge, and that positive charge on what's called that cation lipid or ionizable helps drive it into that cell surface to help push it in. And then there's a, a phospholipid. So I, I knew some of the things already. And you know, at first I thought about the misfolded proteins and how those would react in the human body. And because the human body doesn't have a, a buffer or a detergent to refold a formed protein. That's that's basically prion disease coming in. Um, so the or could be or 
carcinogenic. So the cation, so I started researching because you know I'd called in a Dr. Drew a few times and we were talking about is a lipid a lipid and I started looking at the lipids and what they are. And I started looking at studies prior to 2019 and a couple of during. So there's two things that I want to talk about. One is the lipid itself and then the nanoparticle, but the other is the freeze thaw process. The freeze thaw process is changing the lipid too. So first you've got the pegylated lipid and that studies are showing that it causes inflammation in the body. And that when the spike protein is introduced to the human body, the immune system is actually reacting more with inflammation and cytokines to that pegylated part of the lipid more than it actually is the spike protein. And then you've got the cholesterol. So I found a study before 2019 on cholesterol that was frozen and then thawed. And it was based on blood that was collected from patients who were getting their cholesterol tested. And they found that the cholesterol, when they froze it at minus 20, which had nothing to do with anything we're talking about, it was a totally separate study, but the cholesterol was forming something called uh, two things, but the most important is called phosphatidylethanolamine. And so I studied uh, phosphatidylethanolamine from the cholesterol. That actually makes the body produce prothrombin, thrombin, and fibrin, which are all the necessary Clotting. components to make a blood clot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so so I started studying more, looking more, and I was like staying up for, like so many nights uh, uh, over Christmas and uh, the New Year. We had really bad weather here, and we were snowed in. Um, I started looking up the cation. I found a study that was, it was very extensive and it was done with blood and blood exposed and, you know, lipids to a positively charged surface or a negative charged surface and cations. And the cation itself is also driving the production. It's through a protease. So it interacts with the the cation is part of like the lipid and interacts with the cell surface. And then on that cell surface, it's driving the cells to produce thrombin, prothrombin, and actually excessive platelets. So when it, and the fibrin, so when it, it actually makes the body produce more platelets. So then the platelets are going to clump. And then the other lipids making it clump the cholesterol and making clots. So you have two actions. And then the pegylated system is causing inflammation and your immune system to come in and attack. And then I also found on the uh, positively charged uh, lipid through Avanti chemicals, and I have sent you all the studies on this. If anyone yeah. wants to read it, it'll be in the YouTube comments. In the, in the if you really notes, want to yeah. take a deep dive. That uh, studies have shown that uh, one of those lipids through Avanti uh, literally causes aortic cells in the heart to die. So I was reading all this information and I, I found another study also that was done in 2021 and they quoted Moderna on, again, when the RNA and the experimental product is made in the lab, they freeze it at minus 20, they actually freeze it down sometimes to minus 80, and then it's shipped and it's thawing as it's shipped. We can discuss that because uh, that probably was wrong, done incorrectly too. It's thawing as it's shipped and then they thaw it when it gets to the hospital. This study is huge. It was on cell.com. They found in 2021 that the lipid nanoparticle is degrading. It's not holding the RNA, that the RNA can slip out. And then also beyond the cholesterol and the positive charge stuff we talked about, they found these pockets called uh, DSPC. It's a really long name for a chemical. I don't remember. But I looked up DSPC and I, so DSPC they're finding is part of the lipid nanoparticle when it freeze thaws and it's called a bleb of this chemical DSPC. Two different, every MSDS material data sheet, uh, for those unaware, a material data sheet uh, kind of goes over the chemical properties, the structure of the chemical, and then hazardous to humans or animals or aquatics. When I looked at more than one MSDS safety sheet on this other chemical that's present in the lipid nanoparticle, Fertility issues, issues to uh, fetuses and babies in the womb, neurological damage, uh, genetic damage, uh, 
carcinogenic, which means causes cancer. And that was also something that was, gosh, going back to the, the LNP, uh, I just found another study on the lipid nanoparticle. We talked about that when we were first told that if we got this, that it stayed there and went nowhere else. Mm. Uh, that was another thing I thought of is the lipid nanoparticle is just like diffusing through your body. Like if you think of the, like in science fiction, like somebody walking through a wall, that lipid nanoparticle, it's just like, <clears throat> it's like just passing through your body so fast. Yeah, that's what you mentioned already with the lipid nanoparticle, that coating, giving it the ability to pass through the phospholipid bilayer freely uh, as yeah. a result of the way that it's been engineered. It's the way it's been designed. <laughs> so we've got... There's even more. Can I like say the other two things I just found it like two days ago? Yeah. <laughs> like, Go on about it. I found a, a study, uh, and this was actually, there was one on the CDC's website of all places. It has over 530 studies they host on lipid nanoparticles, some of them they openly admit they're toxic to humans. Uh, the part of the lipid nanoparticle also destroys cells in the ovaries that are important for fertility and um, sex drive. I'm trying to think of another word. Mm -hmm. uh, being in the mood, because we've seen like libido. a decrease in birth number. Libido, there you go. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, uh. mm -hmm. I, I know we talked about that. We didn't mind if we saw or not, but I was like, what the fuck was I going to say? <laughs> so it's a... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so you know we've talked about fertility issues uh, in, in males and females, and that it destroys the cells. Uh, and then for both genetics reproduction in the uterus, the, the ovary, and the testes, and it it has an impact negatively on the hormones that are produced because like estrogen is produced in the the ovaries, right? Uh, there's different parts of the body, so that produces a follicle stimulating hormone. It's been a long day, but um, so you know, not only is it interfering with fertility, it's also interfering with sex drive too, in a negative way. It's decreasing it. And this has now been given to uh, apparently billions of the population across the globe, and it's something that we know due to just the lipid nanoparticle itself. Not even touching on spike, it causes inflammation produces all, all the necessary ingredients for a clot and it has effects on fertility which is something that we are seeing in droves now the netherlands actually i don't know if you've seen has for the first time in history that includes going back to world war ii a higher death rate than birth rate so the population increase has been negative uh when you remove um uh, people emigrating to the Netherlands, that is a negative rate because deaths have been higher than births. That's amazing. And then it's also decreasing the sex drive in people, which will also have a very similar effect to some extent. Now, um, I forgot one other thing. Sorry oh, to interrupt. By all means. <laughs> it's also affecting what's called TLR4, toll like receptor number four, which are found I believe, in the immuno response. Is that responsible uh -huh. for? Yeah. regulates immune system and inflammation yeah yeah and it, it is it is like delivering meaty blows to it so we wondered if that was what was causing like reactivation of if somebody had hashimoto's or making it or immune worse. diseases are coming back yeah yeah i have a, yeah. a multiple a, sclerosis yeah really good friend of mine whose mother had uh uh kicked an illness and it came back right oh. after she'd received a um, particular therapeutic um so i uh i remember talking to him about that and we were talking about different ways that he might potentially be able to support and help her uh as she battles that again and the other thing is um cancers have been on the rise is there anything that you have seen or have read that might be linked to lmps at all uh, in relation to that because one of the other things with the mrna is, within the lipid nanoparticle is it says that it will reproduce it but we have n literally no idea how long that goes on for and everyone's response to it is different we don't know how that uh protein transcription how long it will last right we have no real way to shut off the mechanism so is there anything there that you know of in the research that you've read i'm asking because uh, perhaps mm -hmm. there's something you've come across yeah we have the and then maybe we could touch on the protein in the lab a little bit more in the sheets that were released by jicky on twitter 
and oh, somebody yeah. else for a FOIA request out of Australia and what came out of your area, the EMA. Yeah, the the DSPC chemical that's formed that they're finding when the the lipid nanoparticle degrades after the freeze thaw process. They they found, and this again was cell.com. It was they actually quoted Moderna too in the supplemental data. This chemical called DSPC is carcinogenic and can lead to oh, cancers. Yes. Uh, one of more than one of the studies that other people have been like everybody's been post we met on Twitter. Uh, there's a, a study that talks about the, the spike protein. Uh, there's mechanisms that people talk about, like the ACE2 receptor, uh, but that is uh, causing changes in what's called the PDL1. So if you look at PDL1, is part of the mechanisms of involved in PDL1 is involved in cancer. So if you had a cancer that was related to what is called PDL1, you're probably going to see, you could see an exacerbation. It's not a guarantee. When you talk about cancers, PDL, the thing called PDL1 is involved and the spike protein is impacting PDL1, also uh, BRCA for breast cancer. Um, yeah, I don't know if people follow the ethical skeptic. He's been making charts and they've been really scary when he is pulling all the data on Twitter and he's that guy, I think, was military. He did military um, statistical data analysis. So he, the guy would rely on what he's saying, but that the spike protein is linked to triggering and or causing cancer. Uh, the misfold of proteins, which we haven't gone into a lot yet that we need to talk about, and what's in the vials of the RNA, and how there's fragments in there that we need to discuss and what those are doing, which can lead to oncogenesis, oncogenesis uh, lead to cancer. Hmm. And then the, so we got the lipid leading possible to cancer. They know that chemical DSPC is a carcinogenic and is damaging to fertility, neural degenerative and cancer in the DSPC. And then the other lipid itself, and then the spike proteins. So you've got like a triple hit of your immune systems getting punched in the gut. You have inflammation processes going on. The positive charged lipid is producing thr thrombin, prothrombin, fibrin, you've got, that's leading to clots and it's, it's accelerating it too. And then you've got the cholesterol, which is changing to phosphatidylethanolamine. And that is driving prothrombin, thrombin and, and fibrin. And then the positive charged um, part of the lipid, I like I'm bouncing around, that the study that I found with that uh, is especially active in endothelial cells. And that's like it, the big thing we've all been talking about is the impact on endothelial cells and uh, the, endo or the, the endothelial cells line the layer of the vascular system. Yeah. Oh. So for capillaries, it's arteries, having so the free ride heart. around everything. Yeah. This explains why there's so many systemic issues and, and we've already established that it has free passage to go wherever it wants. So, uh, Okay. Let's let, let's go down the road of the folding proteins, and we'll continue there because we're going to have to come back to the the endothelial cell results of this anyway, and it, it, it'll all come back together. But yeah, okay. So, so I I sent uh, sent you like thirty or forty links to studies to back up everything I'm saying. So whatever yeah. I'm saying, there's a study to back it. That's a uh, reputable journal. All right. So, uh, gosh, let's just go down the list. Number one. Uh, so in the lab, we saw the spike protein. Well, I don't want the spike protein, but if we produced a different protein, like an antibody as a protein, misfold. And then there's a two-step process for the protein to be put back into the shape it's supposed to be. And it's involving a, a what's called a buffer, which affects its you know, acidity versus alkaline, like it's pH. Yeah, and then there's a, a detergent. And the human body doesn't have a detergent. And misfolded proteins are known to uh, interfere with the action of other proteins. And, and proteins, oh my gosh, just like an example. Uh, if anybody takes levothyroxine out there for your thyroid or a thyroxine or some kind of uh, synthroid, when you take that, it takes six to seven days to get to the cells to do what it needs to do. And it gets there via what's called a motor protein. And it's just like, 
one of the, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't look like this, but it's a different protein and it always has little feet and it's just walking along and it like latches on to the, what's called T4 and it takes it for a ride so, and it takes it to cells. So proteins actually transport. They look like they're walking on a little tight rope with these little feet. There's videos on YouTube of, if you want to check it out, of a motor protein. They, they transport chemicals to cells. They interact with lipids. If you've got a folded, misfolded protein, which there's a study that shows the spike protein itself misfolds in the body when generated, it can disrupt other services or other um, uh, things in the body, including uh, it, oncogenic. So it can That's lead so. to cancer. Yeah. And then well, we haven't even touched on you know, what the, the studies were for the lab studies that were released uh, for a FOIA request out of Australia and what the EMA admitted in their actual Pfizer data. So I don't know if we wanted to bounce for that or if we let's go for it. Heard what you what were. was there? All right. So so Jicky and a few other people, there's a bunch of people that label themselves with mice as mice on Twitter. They they posted it was back in April. So I was I was shared this document. For the RNA, they need to validate the RNA. And, and I think that uh, there there's a a machine called the Agilent, and the Agilent uh, looks at RNA, and it will also detect fragments. And if we go back to the RNA, the RNA is complementary to the the DNA, and you know it's just one it's just one piece. But there's a it's connected to a computer screen. And there's a printout, and it's a graph. And there's this really steep curve, and that represents the RNA that's supposed to make the spike protein. Mm -hmm. And that is the only thing that is supposed to be in there. The RNA to make the spike protein is the only thing. And back in April, Jicky had actually sent me a file because Jicky knows that I, I did biotech because we talk. And you know, just an example, say the say the RNA is this, because it's a single line, and there's your yep. peak on the graph. And to the left of that, it's supposed to be smooth and nothing else. And we saw peaks on this on this graph. And we wondered what those were and if those were fragments. So the Australia, their their public records request department that Jiki and others I think uh, found that you know, those those fragments are unidentified. Mm-hmm. And they're in batches that have corresponding numbers to them. Because each batch of the jab in the vials of the experimental product is, it's got a, a number for a batch that was made, you know, like a, a batch of cookies or whatever. And someone did a request on the records of the kids who died in 2021. There was like a, there was a few like 10 year old, seven year old, sorry. And, uh, the batches with the, the 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 peaks that don't belong, which then it was later admitted they're fragments of RNA, just like pieces, not whole. Uh, the the those dirty batches were the ones that killed people, and then in the Australia Pfizer admitted to holding back different batches for its employees only. So so they the, knew essentially that or there was some kind of idea of which batch was what if you look at it like that right they so they were able to they identify knew. which batches would be batches with a different outcome right so then uh at this around the same time so in the united kingdom EM, your ema released a document and i can send the the link and we hmm. hopefully put it down if i didn't already they released a document talking to the we're speaking to the RNA that's in the vials. They also said there's fragments there, but what they said was they're unidentified and unknown origin, and they aren't broken off from that main piece of the, the RNA, the main piece that's, you know, like if this is the RNA again, and then, you know, it makes the spike, the so RNA to spike, you know, there there's little pieces in there. And those little pieces, uh, we know their RNA, but the EMA said, oh, don't worry. Uh, we don't think that your, your immune system is going to respond to it. And if it does, it's not a problem. 
Well, well, EMA, like what I didn't think about is maybe, just maybe, not all the scientists work for you and are paid for and keep their mouths shut. That little pieces of RNA, like I was trying to like, one of my friends, like imagine RNA makes the a big bread or a big, big loaf of bread in your, your bread maker. And, but what if, what if alongside your big piece of RNA, you've got little pieces and, and those number one are going to misfold probably no matter what, but you know, those are going to make muffins, toxic ones that like will hurt you. And so when, again, when both those batches, you know, were, were looked at, they had these little extra markers in the graphs that didn't belong and they're representing that. And so then we, then we are trying to find out if they're what are called micro RNA because micro RNA uh, will absolutely, that is related to cancer. If that's what those little pieces were. So that was just devastating. That was about a couple of months ago that we, we figured that out. And then in Australia, they also put out a notification on their public website that they were allowing the experimental product to be stored for months, specifically at some facility to be used on people who have disabilities. That doesn't, uh, there's no way, there's no way to brush that up to sound like anything other than insidious. Uh, I'm, that, that, that's, so that's, somebody asked like how I was doing and why I wasn't sleeping because I was <clears> crying. Like some of this stuff gets brutal looking yeah. at it. Before we go deeper on that, Australia keeping them in a particular place for a particular subgroup of the population. Is there any way that these fragments could be there by accident? So could this be due to the fact that of bad laboratory, bad manufacturing processes? Because a lot of this stuff was rushed out. So just to play devil's advocate of the fact that look, we, we already know from the data from Japan that there have been vials that have had foreign bodies in them. And from what we're told, at least, it was uh, metal that was found in those particular vials and it was due to bad laboratory, bad manufacturing processes. Is there any chance that what is potentially microRNA fragments is there by chance. If it was malicious or by chance, that's a chance. This, this is this is my question. If it was, yeah. if it was evil, if it was malefic, you know, malefic, male, maleficence or yeah, malfeasance. Malfeasance, yeah. Um. Oh yeah. So we don't know that they might know and may not be telling us. Uh, the EMA said that those were unidentified fragments. Mm -hmm. They also said that the main this graph that the main peak. If you think of like a bell curve and there's like the top of the, this line, this really skinny line, but that is the spike protein. The RNA for it is the size that it is supposed to be. So it did not break up. So that RNA did not break up. So those little pieces aren't broken off from, oh, that from the main one. store. Yeah. So either, so here's your options. The, the little pieces that are floating around of, we don't know what. Oh, and, and they, they also said that it wouldn't, uh, because it didn't have what's called a cap and a tail on it. We, we don't think that's true. There's like, we haven't talked about how things need a cap and a tail to make a protein and yeah. Yeah. But the, they said that it doesn't uh, have what it's required to make a protein. And that's uh total bobbins, proper nutters. <laughs> I think <laughs> friends in the UK <laughs> that is complete. Uh, yeah, complete bobbins. bullshit. Yeah, total fucking no, no, not true. And so, so then you've got the option is that uh, RNA that was supposed to make a spike that degraded or was broken up and it landed in there, or is that manufacturing lab not adhering to what's called CGMP processes of good manufacturing processes where there, there are very tight controls. Like I said, like we, we did small batches and they were validated and quality control was ran on them yeah, constantly for these small yeah. groups. And, and here, uh, like how many times is someone checking? Is it like one every hundred mile, one every thousands? Because that's a lot of uh, tra tracking and checking that has to be done. 
the the other option is that it came from another project that uh, that it's not the and that it's, it's it, but that that seems less likely but then <sighs> but this is only in particular batches as well it's not in every batch that this is there so I did a FOIA request that I'm also, uh, so for the United States, uh, while we're there, I did a FOIA request last week. I've now amended it. I've got uh, the law firm that we talked about. Did we talk about them yet that I'm um, working with? Uh, oh, we spoke helping. about it off off, uh, off the recording. Ah, we got to talk about that one yet too. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I filed similar requests uh, asking for even more proteomics, more data than what we've seen so far on the U.S. side of Pfizer. And right now I'm trying to push on getting that through. But yeah, either it's the RNA for the spike that's broken up. And that doesn't mean that that's not going to make a mystery, whatever. But those those proteins, you know, we already said the spike made in the body misfolds. The study is there. It shows even if, even if everything's right with the RNA, it's going to misfold. You know, there's studies that talk about translational errors where there's like one base pair off, like I always bring up Kevin McKernan. He's uh, MIT genome guy uh, like he was talking about that it could make different proteins if it's one off and read errors and all this bad stuff but yeah it's not it's not pieces in the main so what is it it's either the rna broken up or or you know that came from you know the company i worked for when we sent off the gene sequence to get flanked into the plasma and do everything we needed to do with that that was overseas so so what if the error was made there so so this what we're saying then is that this could be done in error or it, yeah or, or there's the malicious intent but malicious intent is hard to prove however this could be an error for a particular lab because if it is coming in particular batches this could be a particular lab where the batches aren't um <clears throat> the quality control isn't as good uh they're not following their iso standards so their manufacturing process might not be as good as well so there are options there we don't necessarily have to believe that the world is pure evil uh, despite the fact of australia doing their best um keeping particular vials um locked away for a particular subgroup of the population which there's no way of slicing that to make it sound like it's a good thing do you want to talk about cold chain production? Because I'm really knowledgeable. Or cold chain. Yeah, and, we can. Uh, the, freeze, the freezing. I think that the, would only take like two minutes. But. This then also goes into the fact that there could be fragment breakdown during the uh, because of the cold chain breakdown, right? Oh, so it's not even a breakdown. The LNP is breaking down just because it's frozen and thawed. Doesn't matter. Frozen okay. and thawed LNP degrades. Cholesterol changes to phosphatidylethanolamine, which drives the formation of clots, thrombosis, DVT, pulmonary embolism. And then the uh, LNP, the lipid nanoparticles, breaking down. Oh, we were going to talk about, too, you asked about how it stays in the body for a long time and keeps going and going and going. The lipid nanoparticle was also designed to have the, you know, the RNA enter the cell and... There's no ribosome here, but it's there's a little organelle, a little blob that the RNA would enter and go into what's called the ribosome. The LNP was designed to not leave the ribosome for I, I don't know what extent of time. And we don't have the information as to what extent of time either, due to the fact that, uh, well, all studies have been cut short on this or they're, they're not going on long enough for us to know. So if it's staying on the ribosome, it's continually coding. Mm -hmm. Which can uh, can cause ribosomal overload. Can Which you because uh, expand. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yeah. Yep. And uh, there's you have your endoplasmic reticulum involved, your ribosome. Uh, those are two parts of the inside of the cell. All people really need to know is that those are the two parts inside the cell that, when RNA is involved. Your body is making proteins all day long. I forgot how many the liver makes. Is it 100 million? Like it is a crazy amount. The number of proteins your liver makes in a day. Like your body's making proteins all day long. There's someone else arguing that recombinant RNA was the same as human, and that's just not true. 
So your ribosomes are also doing the same job with your own RNA. And it's, it's doing that all day long. But what if you burn out the thing that's supposed to make your proteins on a daily basis? So I did find a study where when it's stuck in there and it just keeps going, 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 you can have what's called you know, transcriptional errors where it's it's reading, you know, the RNA is a bunch of pieces of code, you know, like if it even skips one little you get part. A completely different protein. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not what's called an antimer. It's a you know, you just put a, a Frankenstein thing. You it's already Frankenstein in your body, but now it's a, a really probably toxic. Um, and then also the, you know, RNA, like we knew there were extra caps on the end and this what's called pseudo uridine instead of uridine. Uridine is uh, one of the base pairs in the, the RNA instead of thymine, which is in DNA, but the pseudo uridine, like we don't, there's, there's bad studies on that too. So it's a combination of it, the RNA is breaking down slower because they like capped the ends and then it's being held in the ribosome, but then the ribosome is basically becoming exhausted when you ask, you know, what does ribosomal burnout okay. mean yeah. in the endoplasmic? So that means, you know, sometimes the body, our body doesn't make proteins exactly the way it should, but we have mechanisms involved to handle that because it's so rare. But, but what if you burn out the thing that makes your proteins all the time or you, you know, it's weakened. It's going to so keep that can have a, faulty ones, right? Um, might be. It can also be oncogenic and uh, not have uh, the same processes within the body. You know, it's going to screw up. Which it's actually our immune system because we do create potentially cancerous cells right. naturally as well. Uh, a, fully fit individual will also have a couple errors as you've mentioned it, it happens as a natural process within the body and our uh, natural immunity will then take care of that our uh, is it the t killer cells that get rid of the uh cancerous cells that occur in the body if my immunology isn't uh yeah yeah so for um car t therapy that i may or may not have had a hand in for the leukemia treatment right now car t cell yeah yeah so B cells are involved so if it's gone into overdrive and it's just continually producing spike or now producing errors and that's overloaded and we've already established that the LMP can cause inflammation we've already established that it can cause clotting and a whole bunch of other stuff and then we've got another potential layer there where the oncogenicity it, it, it's just exponentially getting worse if our body's not able to combat it, to fight it. So the follow-up question I was going to ask you is what does that mean for the body if we get ribosomal overload? But I think we've kind of covered it, and the answer is it's not very pretty. I don't know specifics. Uh, I've only found a couple of studies talking about it because I don't think it's ever been in, in something that came up. So the the going theory then of what is out there it's not great no no and then okay. you've got the fertility issues uh the misfolded proteins in the prion like disease so like kreutzfeldt jacob where it's you know, if you've got misfolded proteins fragments that can lead to neurogenetic issues i think when people talk about long covid and brain fog, is that being caused? Because I think in autopsies, they found full, you know, going back to your other question, full spike in the brain months later, hmm. just months, months later in a deceased individual. I've seen a study and, where they've seen spike being produced like up to 15 months afterwards. And the only reason we say up to 15 months is because it hadn't at that point in time been there long enough or it had been out long enough for us to see further down the line which is why again these things normally take years to produce so that we have the long-term data exactly it, 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 this is going to cause well, speculation sorry go on. oh so i was going to say like do we want to talk about the freeze thaw process and how yes. long it lasts yeah. and then let's go there otherwise then i'm, I'm gonna 
yeah, if you want to talk about the cold chain and then, yeah. Okay. All right. So, and I worked for the top plasmid company in the world, even though I worked in the protein department, which was recombinant proteins, antibodies, CRISPR. But oftentimes we had to ship product overseas. Uh, it is so easy to ship to the UK, my friend, from the US. <laughs> it goes very smoothly, two to three days. We can ship $100,000 of a little vial. So uh, these little vials of like CRISPR that look, that wasn't custom made usually. That was something that my company already made. And it would be in a little vial this big, $100,000. You know, if you had a more up, up to a million. And it's got to get there at minus 20. So I worked with uh, the shipping department and our head of the shipping, she did a study with our quality control and they tested bunches of boxes and I'll explain how a box is made, how it's put together. So people understand what is going on. Cause you're just not sending it in a shoe box or like a present box. Like what keeps it at minus 20? So our head of quality control tested every box in the market. They cost about $200 each. They're about uh, this big, this big, Maybe a little bigger, and they've they they have a lot going on on the inside for the the panels. So there's only a small space to fit something, and they again they cost two hundred dollars each. So she tested all the boxes. The top box that she found by doing what you need to do to get it prepped uh, lasts five days maximum to hold the internal temperature of minus twenty. So these boxes look like I didn't bring another pot for that, like a cardboard box before it's assembled. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've seen a cardboard box flat. So that is frozen in a freezer for 48 hours minimum at minus 80. And it has these, um, do they have lunch? I feel like, do I need to ask lunch bags? Like, I don't know what you call those. Of course, okay. of course. We're <laughs> a, a technologically advanced country over there too. <laughs> well, we have differences in language. Like we call oatmeal, you call porridge. Yeah, we yeah. could we could talk about other things that are probably inappropriate here, but like we have different <laughs> ways of saying things. Like the United States uh, smoking a cigarette, you call it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you tried to catch me out there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, oh, yeah. so 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 we, you know if you think about a lunch uh, like a lunch bag or a lunch pail when you take your lunch or dinner or whatever food somewhere, you've got if you, if you've seen these frozen panels that you can frozen little things that you can put in your freezer at home, this mm -hmm. little ice block. Yep. Imagine an entire box made with those lining, lining it frozen to minus 80. So the panels themselves have to be frozen to minus 80 within this cube, almost like this box you're going to ship it in. And then not with your bare hands, of course, you're, you're constructing it wearing like special gloves and you have to put it together. And the box itself internally, the panels are frozen to minus 80, that's, that's freaking cold. And it takes 48 hours to freeze that and prepare each one, each box. And then the you know, the RNA, the experimental product is gonna be placed inside that box. And from the moment you pull that box out of the minus 80 freezer, that's when you start the clock at five days. So the internal temperature will hold in those boxes for minus 20, but only one kind of box. I forgot the name that was used a lot. All the other boxes aren't as good. So like when we shipped to the UK, you know, it'd take two to three days to get there, no problem through your customs, but we had issues with companies. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of the company because it'd be, uh... let's just say the companies we did use, FedEx and uh, BioCare, all other companies failed in getting it there in five days or less. They couldn't get one box there yes. within five days. So and we used them all. Down. We tested them all more than once. Right. So if you ship a product to you know, South Korea, we, I think one of the Koreas we shipped stuff that didn't make it on time because their customs, it takes a lot longer. So five, five billion doses of this stuff went out. At least at least five hundred billion or five billion, five billion rather, not five hundred billion. Five billion people got at least one dose of this stuff. So when I think about the time, the freezer space. That would be needed to freeze these on site to ship these boxes out to hold an internal temperature of minus 20 and then get to the hospital. And then the hospital has to put it in their proper storage. And then the Pfizer, like they just released another set of uh, documents, like several thousand from ICANN. 
they, they put it right in there. You know, there's only, I think it's like two up to so much time. Was it a week or they've been changing? And then we read it from Australia that they said they could hold it for months in the reg in the regular time. freezer. Hmm. Is that, yeah, this is, uh, um... I don't think it worked out regularly anyway. Cause oh, yeah, so like as an example, like I worked with researchers that have PhDs and they're, they're in like research, top research hospitals or pharmacy. And, you know, I, I sent uh, something to somebody like a product, like they ordered a little amount of protein. And about a week later, I get a call. I won't say his name. He's like, Christy. I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> it's like our shipping dude put it in the wrong freezer, man. Like, can you make more like as fast as possible? I'm like, oh, like no problem. Like we we have it on enough to like get them. Stop. Cause, yeah, because yeah, a lot of these researchers they're involved with things for either cancer or genetics or you know they are in time schedules and so are the pharmaceutical companies where they're talking to a board and you know everybody's under our own schedules. That's where a lot of the anxiety came from. Like I worked eighteen hour days, for example. It was devastating. There's a reason I don't do that anymore for a company. But uh, yeah, so I, I send this guy the you know the replacement. I swear it was four days later, like the phone rings. And, and before I could like say my name fully, I'm like, shut the front door. Are you serious? Like what happened? And so, someone again put it in the wrong freezer. So if uh, people with PhDs who do this stuff all, what am I trying to say? Like I, I would like the proof that this was stored properly at the hospitals and the but wherever it's been, I, I want the proof of that. Like I can't come well, out and say you didn't do the right job, but I think there's like so many moving components. Like we already know it all. It causes, it can cause cancer, infertility, clots, immune uh, problems. But in addition to it broke down. Yeah. Well, in there's the, no way. In, in, How did they roll all that out? In they the couldn't even get my mail to my door. Oh, it's a little bit more delicate than the mail. So you'd hope they do a bit of a better job, but in the Netherlands, um, what they did uh, so you mentioned australia said oh we can hold it for months in the freezer yada 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 the netherlands had or a broken freezer so um what? the the netherlands had a broken freezer and they didn't say this to the populace what they said was they made a massive push for the experimental products and i think it was for the uh az uh the j and j the Janssen, and they made a little campaign of dancing with Janssen. so that means dancing with Janssen but it rhymes so fantastic and the reason that they did this was they said if you do this and you do one of these then your grants do everything your you get your special passport and all the rest of it it came out months later that they knew that that was a lie uh and that the reason that they were pushing it was because of the fact they had the broken freezer so all of these were going to go to waste so wow. It is very well known by those who are in charge that the cold chain is important. And so much so that they're willing to lie to the populace and be found out about the breakdown of the cold chain element of this. So it, it baffles the mind really that this is something that we're even having to talk about, that this is something that's even going on. Yeah, it's depressing reading the studies. That's an understatement. And then the number, it, it never should have rolled out. It never should have rolled out. Uh, Dr. Corey and others have said, I don't know if he said this, I don't want to misspeak here. It, it never should have rolled out. No. Uh, it was used for 50 to 60 people who have a genetic disorder who are only going to live, you know, they're going to live till they're 30. They're suffering, they're in pain, they can't eat, they're having to drink starch, whatever it is. And this is their way to possibly have a normal life, but to have side effects, like there's just so many side effects that occurred. And I wonder if, like you said, it was the mass production of things. It was just a combination of everything. Like I've thought about, is there a way to do, would, would there have been a way to do this safely? The answer is no. Well, okay. If we're talking about doing this safely, let's go back to the initial trial then. Oh yeah. We have to talk about how the others, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good, good, good. Sorry. Yeah, but take it away. So, so the initial trial, safety, all that jazz. Mm. Did it? Does it pass the sniff test? 
Did no. it pass the sniff test? Not that I not that I have read because I've gone over all those files. So when we go back to getting the RNA, getting it to the lab, because you want to make the protein, the spike protein first in the lab in a cell. So you, you want it in this, in a vial, before you even start to think about what happens in the human body with the immune system and all the other things going on, hormones. So in the lab, for the first part, so we talked about steps and things you want to do in order. The first part you do is make the protein in cells a bunch of times. Even if you only did it one time, like a batch, you want to do more than that. You do a batch. You do the, you purify it. Like, again, we like take all the stuff that came out of the thing and it, there it goes. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, it's fun. But you, you know, you purify it. You, you get your protein of interest. The next step happened to be something I was also involved in. I just wasn't in person. In Germany, they do what is called in animal, in the animal antibody discovery, where you're not making an antibody in a lab, you're making an animal make the antibody. Yeah. So the next step that would have been, if we're saying March was when they got approval and to run it for Pfizer, and then they did human trials in May, which is not even eight weeks. The next step after making the protein in the lab and doing all the tests is make sure that it's exactly how it's supposed to be to make the spike protein and not hurt people. Another question, why would you make that part of the virus when it's the most harmful part you know? The next part is in the animal. So in Germany, the next step after you know it's making the protein you want, you make the protein in the animal. And there's two parts of animal studies. The first part would be what's called the in the animal antibody discovery. So they inject them the RNA into the animal or the DNA. And then the body of the animal will start making antibodies. And then sadly, you know, you have to destroy the animal. You take the blood, which is called supernatant. You send it back to my lab where those scientists out there, I make the work orders and design the workflow for that. Put that blood through this thing and purify it again, and then you isolate the antibodies out of it, and then you use what are called assays and ELISA and some other things to see what antibody was made. Was it just one? Was it a bunch? So that was uh, when they talked about uh, doing the study on eight rats, they injected the RNA into the rat. The rat made the spike, or I don't know, they never told us. <laughs> it made something. The erratic may have made the spike. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't even know if that's completely true because there's been some uh, documents released online that say there's inserts and there's some theories. Hmm. But so the eight rats that people talked about, so that was also done in the 2020 trial. And what I didn't know, uh, so I didn't see, so after you have the, Purification, which again happens weeks. So you could write down three to four weeks added on to for the rat studies on top of the first study with the protein before you get to human, because you've got to do the animal first. After that, then you start monitoring the heart rate of the rat, uh, its blood pressure, does it have a fever? Is it hunched over? Is it eating? You know, is it turning colors? And I think there were some rats with pups that died. And first they were saying it, it didn't have to do with that in the study, and this is the 2020. But then you go on to monitor the animal, and then you usually go on to primates. So you go from rats to primates, because rats aren't close to humans, but primates are. So with all that, we started human trials at in May. So there's no way that that happened uh, in the steps that they did. So there's only a couple of three things that could have happened there. Either they started the first process where I talked about the, the RNA getting sent off, getting put through the labs and you know, making it in the cell in the lab. Either that started in January and they didn't say that and they were already in process of those milestones in order or they said, screw it, okay, we're going to like jump to, they're going to run it in parallel. And I think that's what they did because they knew they were going to get authorization anyway. And all they had to do was produce some documents which there's some also things talking about that LNP. There's some other things we got to talk about because they had the LNP listed as not a 
pharmacologically active. How, how do they get away with that? By this point, anyone listening will know that this is an active. They call it an excipient. So that's why they didn't have to test it. They got the FDA to agree to it. Fantastic. It's good when you have friends in the FDA. Jesus, you can get anything oh. done. Uh, but so, the, but the, the only thing I can think of is that they they left. They hadn't done. They just did it all at once. Yeah. So they Unless were running they everything otherwise. in parallel. Prove me otherwise, Pfizer. Go ahead. I'm not saying it's 100, percent but there's no way on God's green earth that they did it starting in March. No, it's not uh, a physical impossibility. There's also the um, the Fauci emails that were leaked. I have, um, I have that day. I have that. I got that like the day after. Yeah, so there's there's something um, within those where I think there was an email, if I'm not mistaken, that was talking around December January time about starting up the process oh, yeah. to create um, a particular medical intervention. So it could be because you mentioned as well the other possibility of they did start running things in January. They just didn't mention that. They just said that they started everything off in March. So that is also another option that without telling people, because as you mentioned, some of the 2020 data in the animal rat data wasn't very positive. So uh, from where I'm sitting, at least one reason for you saying that you're starting it all in March rather than January is if you're going to go January to May, that's a hell of a lot of time for data to be produced and to be looked at. If you're going from March to May, despite the fact that people much like yourself are going to know that mm, there's a little bit of bullshit to here. This doesn't add up. Not everyone's going to be asking questions. People are going to be desperate to see something move along. So then they can obfuscate that bad rat data and say everything started off in March. So just, just take what we give you from March onwards. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I know this is, this does you know, cause for some speculation, which ideally neither of us want to do. You know, right. It's the reason you sent me so many papers. It's the reason everything that you're saying, you say, listen, if you want to fact check it, it's all there in the description. Right. Some of the studies that I know uh, are out there and that some people are writing sub stacks about studies, the studies that I am quoting are not hypothetical. They've huh. been ran physically. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're pretty peer reviewed and they're in right. you know, prominent journals. journals. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what does this all mean for us then, for the members of the public? So we now know, without a doubt, that the LMPs are less than ideal for the human body. We now know that there's a high likelihood, high chance of breakdown in the cold chain and the effects that that can have. And as you've already outlined, the fact that regardless of cold chain breakdown, the LMP freezing and thawing process is already detrimental. And yet this is the package that it's being delivered in every time for every one. How does this all break down for us, for the general population, for those people that have taken this product? I can only guess some of this. We know that some people are very adamant about taking the experimental product and pushing it on others and in medical offices. And there's people that are pushing back when you say, what isn't what's happening for us? So I, uh, I have had people reach out to me, uh, whistleblowers and uh, attorneys. And so I, we said we didn't talk about that on camera yet, correct? So I'm consulting no. right now with the lead law firm that I won't name, unless they'd like to name me. So I'm because I have the process and project development of all the steps in the cold chain and all the, the knowledge to point to what they need to in litigation. So I'm, I'm consulting for the top firm for litigations, both on the side of Pfizer and the government and calling out their shenanigans and the complete fuckery that happened. Uh, even like recently I found on the CDC website, stacks.cdc.org.com, uh, you know, the studies calling out the lipid nanoparticle was toxic and saying that they didn't know. And then, and then they allowed it. So I'm consulting with them. So you know, they've got their own consultants too, but I'm, I've been giving them studies 
and helping them review what they're presenting for the litigation for the government. And then I'm also giving information to the side of this law firm that is about to start the litigations for the people who are injured and harmed to help them with the backend knowledge to say, here's the mechanisms that caused this. This is why this happened. So it helps with the litigation for those representing those who've been injured or have died. Uh, I have agreed to testify in court if that's what they need me to do as well. But I know we're talking about civilization, like a, like I don't know if you want to talk medical and what the implications are. Of that. No, no, this this is um, this is exactly what I was kind of leaning into because I think the outcome of what this means for people is we are going to have people that are injured now. Whether it's malicious or not, neither of neither of us can say that. But what we can definitely say is the fact that the proper steps for the production of a therapeutic weren't followed. And this is the outcome, regardless of intent. The outcome is going to be that there are going to be people who are negatively affected. And they are uh, negatively affected in many of the ways that you've already outlined, even before any issues with spike as one of the big things that's in the last year and a half is everyone talks spike 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 but actually even before we get to the spike the delivery mechanism is also causing issues it may be even worse or like equal bad or or worse yeah and it's causing reproduction problems it's it's, uh tissue death cell death necrosis that's another thing it does oh god damn it this gets worse as it goes on Uh, this is a serious black pill like yeah <laughs> I mean, in yeah it's, just, but, it's a nightmare but, and yeah uh, the process is like um in my my own so i have a foia request as well with the fda they've already pushed back and they didn't say no to me they told me just go to our website so now i have the law firm that i'm consulting with backing me on my own foia so they are reviewing it and they're going to add some firm legal language to it but uh, you know i'm asking for all the files we talked about the RNA would validate it. You know, was there just one peak? I also looked up on the website, uh, how bad is my batch or whatever, uh, a few of the websites that people have entered the Bayer's data where it shows the most people died per batch. So I'm asking for all those batches mm. and all the the RNA, the spike protein, everything that was done for the analysis. I asked for a year and a half worth of data. Plus I asked for those, for lack of a better phrase, death batch. So then you know, we can line up and they prove, even though we already know, there's this died suddenly as well. Then I asked for some control batches too. And I also asked if there were any that were held back for employees that those analysis also be given to me to be released to the public immediately. So so we're, we're, doing, we're doing that to at least help. So this is- Stop this it. Is, yeah. Uh, so we have these people that are th- therapeutic injured. And you're helping to consult. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing there? So you've already mentioned that you're working with a law firm. What is your role there? And what is it that you're you're doing with those people that are therapeutically injured or doing on behalf of those people that are therapeutics injured? I'm giving the same information which I just gave here and extra that were either due to time or just going into details and it's beyond the scope. They tried to keep everything, you know, you know, this was for fun, but to give someone like a visual representation so it's not so abstract. But it is on the uh, injured side of things to give them the data and link the data. So right now, like uh, someone asked why I hadn't been on a Twitter space and I like was in talks with some people and the scientists have kind of been left behind. And I think it's because they don't have a way to explain it and bring it down to layman's terms. But So they need a bridge. So I'm the bridge. I uh, Most people that work in biotech work for a company and they are what are called captured. So they can't speak out, right? No. I own my own business, so fuck it. So I'm the bridge between the, you know, trying to figure out the causes that we talked about and then having the studies. So I'm I'm reading things that they send me. Also on the, the litigation side against Pfizer and involving the FDA and the CDC. So they, I'm reviewing documents uh, to see if it 
it's missing anything. For instance, all the LNP stuff we added and then finding that document on the CDC's website definitely was incriminating to them, knowing that the LNP was bad. So I'm reviewing documents and providing information and what I know for the use of RNA and the projects I worked on, comparing it to this, uh, it's just everything, everything we're talking about right now, but uh, to use my role as a project manager and process manager to be an expert witness and specialist because they need somebody up there and they don't have somebody up there that worked the processes to be able to, because I, I worked the small batches and I've seen the large scale to be able to explain why. Okay. I, I can't think of another way that I'm the physical bridge between the studies and the data. Yeah. Yeah, you can extrapolate and put it across as it's almost definitely going to come down to uh, this going to a court of law as there's, right. yeah. there's. Also, there's... I do fear for my safety and while we're at it, at no time do I want to harm myself, others, the elderly or children. I have no thoughts of hurting myself in any way, no intent, just an FYI. I have gotten some pretty nasty stuff. Uh, for... I've heard other people have been... Uh, feared for their life. For anyone that thinks Christie's being facetious, this is also something that Elon Musk has recently had to say as well on uh, a Twitter space because of the fact that when people blow the whistle, unfortunately, there are those who who don't take too kindly to it. As uh, listeners of the podcast have, have probably heard before, John Kiriakou, the one, uh, the man who blew the whistle on uh, the torture in uh, of those captured uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan also mentioned he was getting death threats. John Perkins also mentioned death threats. Um, Nicole Siratek has also gotten death threats. Any whistleblower that has come out, and like Christy has mentioned, there are people that work within the industry who won't speak out. This is the reason. So when people ask themselves the question, well, if things were that bad, more people would say something. Well, they can't. And this is one of the reasons because their their livelihood, uh, their families, their own personal safety, this is all at risk. Um, so glad that you've said it. Uh, yeah, it's out there for the public to hear. You don't have any. No suicidal intent to ideation harm myself. Right? Yeah, no. no ideation. If you had run through the Columbia suicide asset with assessment with me, I have no thoughts of harming myself or others. No intent. Uh, I am of sane and sound mind. And. Yeah, one of the other things that happens to to whistleblowers is they're um, sometimes fed false information, as we spoke about last night, or they're given. Someone tried to do that to me. Yeah, the, you know. The, Thank you. The, yeah, no worries. There, there are crazy things that that can happen out there. So, yeah, I've been this... targeted. My my DMs on Twitter look like a crime scene. <laughs> I'm glad I got there early then. Uh, <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. Yeah. I'm, like connected, I'm connected with the other scientists and the people and we have chats. So it, I feel like we're one big hive mind that we're working together. It, it's great to see so many people who are pushing forward with exposing the actual realities around this and willing to speak about it. Because one of the most important things in science is open and honest debate but you can only have open and honest debate if both sides are allowed to be able to speak and to put information out there so thank you for that but where do you see this going you're involved in multiple court cases there are multiple hundreds of thousands of people that have suffered we have this now died suddenly skyrocketing we've got excess deaths coming out the wazoo where do you think this all goes where do you think this all ends i hope that it stops um you know people talk about it being investigated and that it needs to be paused it needs to be stopped i had hope in the beginning when i was first reading the the data presented on the cdc's white sector that was fda for the united states side you know, they presented the the data of, of like the age groups, like you know, 18 to 25 of people who got the experimental intervention in the clinical trials, right? And then they listed up headaches, stomach ache, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, malaise. But in nowhere in that area did it say heart attack, stroke, 
zero. And I kept calming it and calming it. So when it first came out, I, mean, I know I'm like going off to the weeds here for your question. When it first came out and I looked at it, I thought, wow, did they like figure out a freaking way to make this work? Because there was a lot of high risk stuff going on from the, the trials that, you know, that I was involved in in the projects. And there was a reason that it was done on people who are not going to live long because they're, they used to like plan B is, yeah, plan A is not doing well anyway. So I, I, I don't know that I can say, I know there's a lot of political forces at play and it seems like there are different lenses that are muddying the water when it comes to people that have theories of why things are happening and that needs to just stop. Uh, just talk about the science and the people that have been harmed. I think it's going to take in the United States two years if, if we have, uh, I'm not filtering this through any lens, by the way, like left or right doesn't matter. Uh, it's bad. But unfortunately, it's going to take a Republican president back in our office, I think, to stop this. I know uh, Ron DeSantis' team with uh, like uh, Dr. Bhattacharya and like uh, Dr. Kuldor. Well. Yeah, uh, Brett Weinstein is there all part of that group that where they're litigating. Um, number one, they've got to get a hold of what's called the master batch record. It contains every document at every station at every step of the way. There's only one of them, and your pe people have access, and it would take a judge order to get it. That would show everything that we talked about, every batch analysis that was done on this stuff to see what was happening if they knew, and they covered it up. So when you say where this is going, if it is proven that somewhere in along the line saw, like say, say there was uh, somebody working in quality control and they're at the bench and they said to their supervisor, hey, what the fuck? There's all these little fragments in here that don't belong. And what if the supervisor said, fuck it, like we've got to get this out the door. People are dying because that was the was being told to everybody. And Delta was a stronger, more violent. Like, I think there was more. Yeah, sickness strain. going yeah. on compared to Omicron. So I think it's fair to say that. Plus it was something new and everything else was going on with the, you know, everybody's locked down. People are going to be being told they're going to die. They're going to anxiety. Everybody's anxiety and panic was like through the freaking roof. So I, I think it's, you know, it's going to depend on if they can crack what is called the master batch, batch, master batch record, the MBR. If they can get a hold of all those documents and, and if it's in there and someone let it pass, uh, that'll show negligence and that will change this from bad to worse, I guess. I guess well, it, I, I see it ending. So I, I see, because didn't the CDC recently state, whoopsies, we now have a safety signal. Shit, there's like 40 oh, yeah. out there. Wasn't there like 800? Due to the bivalent like first... booster. Yeah. Yeah. For clots. So I think they're... Oh gosh, so so I've taken five ethics classes. When you ask, and I, like I, I think back to my bioethics class, which was so freaking amazing. Uh, like we covered a new uh, conundrum every week about you know is this ethical? What could have been done? Like never get your DNA tested or on file. Never, 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 never. No, no. like Minority Report. Like we think about uh, yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. I see Minority Report like. Never get a functional MRI of your brain. You can get a regular MRI, but never get a functional MRI. Okay. So is that kept going up on a tangent? Then... Oh, I did not know that that was another one where they're playing that's just weird. games with. Oh, that's what we were advised to do because there's been a couple of mass murderers or uh, murderers that killed children. And then they found via functional MRI, there's just one little spot in their brain that might have caused their behavior. But what if you have that spot, but you don't have that behavior? Kind of like a, getting your genetics on file. Like I know the big hospitals like Mayo and a couple other places have this. Like be a part of our genetics collection. Help us out. Nope. <laughs> Never. Mm -mm. This is your a own for your own problem. diagnosis. If you think Gina, yeah. Like, but if your own, but yeah. So why? Well, like I totally went out there. So you were asking. Um, no, what you were talking about happen. master batch records. Yeah, I mean, so master batch records. So like, okay, so like when. The master batch record is going to log when the aren't the gene seek everything, everything. But that, yeah, if that's if these records have any deviation in them, as well as anyone who intentionally ignored, that's going to show, I would think that would show criminal negligence. The thing is, there you've got, as you'd already mentioned, so there's there's two things. Uh, from when I spoke to Brooke, uh, Brooke Jackson, um, 
you have the fact that when they talk about side effects, you think have things like stomach aches. And this was what Maddie Degary was put oh. down as, oh. despite the fact that the poor girl was put in a wheelchair and it was far more than a stomach ache. And this was from just the clinical trial phase. And then there's the other aspect of the fact that Brooke has the paperwork uh, that she has in the trial as well of side effects that were changed or edited after the fact. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there any potential you think, given the level of malfeasance that we have up to this point, that even the MBRs could also be potentially fiddled. Yeah, that's true. Oh, when I was leading back to my ethics class, we learned uh, that even if someone's presented with the data, it doesn't mean they're going to change their viewpoint because people will try to use the data to enforce their own opinion. Yeah. Uh, so we're. it's going to take a whole hell of a lot to change opinions of people with data, um, yeah, I remember on Brooke's website, she also had resumes of people who were listed as associate scientists who never stepped foot in college and came from a taco restaurant. No offense, I love tacos. I'm not saying that keep making tacos, but that they were listed as associate scientists for Ventavia that worked at a restaurant and that was their last job and they were high school. She also mentioned boxes of the experimental product laying on the floor and like, uh, it, yeah. you know, Frank McCormick uh, playing kick the shoe with the boxes uh i don't know if you know frank mccord no. frank mccord from uh angela's ashes and uh tis where they like kick the shoe down the street and they're just like making a joke like boxes were laying on the floor not in a refrigerator uh so many bad things um it's like all piecemeal so i feel like a lot of us are siloed they need to bring more scientists uh like i, I joined the you know i don't know who else is consulting for that law firm But we like we know like just from you know Twitter is real life, but it isn't because people get canceled there. But we know from the posts and things we've heard, like I've heard everybody I know knows someone who's gotten been injured or die died. Everybody. Yep. Even I just recently moved back to this area. You know, I asked the guys that were helping move my stuff with the move truck. Both of them said people in their family under the age of forty died. And I know it's anecdotal, but we all share it, and we're not lying. And then we're dealing with people who say. Well, my dad and my mom died and my sister's, you know, in a wheelchair. What you said about Maddie and it's called scrubbing the records. Like that's probably done in other clinical trials too. We just never saw it to this extent because they had free reign with the emergency authorization yeah. that it was going to go no matter what. You've got Ernest <sighs> Ramirez as well. His son died yeah. days after. Yeah. There's so many examples and 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 going back to what you mentioned. But, but people will, will still get it though. Like People, but that's what I meant, though. Like, I could say, you know, I'm not this person. I could say, you know, both my parents died or one person died, but I'm still going to get it. I still feel good about it. There were those people, uh, there were even articles that were saying that, oh, person X died, but because they'd had the therapeutic intervention, it's okay because it could have been worse. They've already <laughs> died. How on earth? Yeah. What goes through someone's heads? But Oh, so um, I, like maybe we need like a different meetup for that because uh, I have two psychology majors here. They keep talking <laughs> about mass psychosis, but the the book that really covers it that I encourage everyone to read or check out is "Rape of the Mind" by Juiced Mirlu, who's a psychoanalyst, and he studied the prisoners in the uh, Nazi in the Germany camps, and it goes through the list of. What does it take to change someone's mind? Uh, because mass psychosis just doesn't cover it. But he goes through isolation, uh, bonding with your isolation, forced teaming, uh, manipulation, that you need breaks from isolation in order to kick. Like it, it just all, like when I read it, it all mirrored the last three years. It, it was, and he wrote it uh, 50, 60 years ago. Have you read uh, Biderman's chart of coercion at all? Uh, no. the chart so it's um it sounds like it's in a similar vein to uh what you're saying there with yoast uh and world war ii this is a fellow who uh i forget his first name dr biderman looked at the torture that was done to prisoners of vietnam i want to say and it's the exact same thing 
uh, what you're saying with regards to the different steps that you need in order to manipulate someone. Uh, so you've got social isolation, showing omnipotence, um, occasional indulgences, so releasing yeah. the isolation. Uh, you've got... Uh, God damn it. She forced teaming oh, was another one. That's actually a sociopathic trait from Gavin De Becker's book, The Gift of Fear, Forced Teaming. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, okay. And it starts in the othering of people and the shaming of other people, so it becomes almost cult-like where there's the... The jabbed um, versus the unjabbed, and they're no longer seen as humans, they're seen as others. Yeah, yeah. And there's um enforcing uh change of language, arbitrary rules, change of language. Yeah. It's phenomenal to see how well this was all done. Like hats off. Hats <laughs> off to those that did it, because they did it so well. Um yeah, that's also assuming there was further intent behind this, of course, which we're not necessarily saying there is or there isn't, there was or there wasn't. But yeah, when you slice it. We know it that, up, but... oh, I forgot her name, that uh, researcher from Wuhan that talked about the fear and cleavage site and what was inserted and why. And so, this, so there's there's the other big question that uh, I, that I struggle with and so do others. You have the you have the virus, it's a round ball, it's got little things on it. You can make any protein in the world you want to make a thing. That's part of that virus, like the spike protein is part of the virus, but you, you could have made another part of the virus. They chose to make the thing that harms and maims and kills and put it into people. So I keep thinking about that. So the other scientists, like we've talked, why didn't they make this part of the virus? And I think they made some excuse that it wasn't going to mutate. That they so, were doing the spike protein because it wasn't going to mutate, so it would be there within the body for your immune system to respond to. It's not your immune system, by the way. It's your antibody. Your immune system has complemented. It has a whole bunch of other shitload of things going on. That's also you know, untrue. But they could have chosen some other part of the... Of the virus itself. Yeah, and I think yeah. you asked me before, like the difference between a traditional, I don't want to say the V word, uh, to get this channel or video shut down the traditional carrot like i i knew you asked me in the beginning like the difference between the traditional carrot and this thing mrna like yeah the, yeah like the flu the flu carrot or uh the tdap or pertussis or tetanus you know that used to be made in eggs and the virus would be grown up and then it would be weakened a little bit and then injected into you and then your body would react to an already made outside of you thing Whereas, you know, this is, and then I think it wasn't used in eggs anymore. It was in synthetic, but yeah, this was only used prior. And before the projects that I was working on, I know it's on all the, like everybody knows it's on the news stories that uh, for HIV and the other studies, it was a complete failure because of side effects or death when they tried RNA in the past. But I think that was a larger scale where the company that I worked for either made the proteins or the antibodies and it would put, like it would have been like the monoclonal antibody treatment. That would have been something I would have managed a project on. That helped a lot of people when mm -hmm. they were sick for a time. But it's totally different. Yeah, and and instead of making these little batches too, they made it at unchecked by, oh, so another thing on my request, I feel like, a, sorry again, the I requested for studies on the heterogeneity, heterogeneity between vials. So I asked for like so much analysis, but I also asked for them to give me analysis if they had it. And if they didn't do it, state so. Like that was everything that I asked for. If you didn't do this, state so. But if you did, give it to me and we'd give it to the public. But it was to analyze the differences between the vials. Like, um, like we want to see if there were blanks. If there were vials that had nothing in it, just to... Uh, LMP. Oh. Uh, there may have that been a study done. There might have been someone who got his hands a hold of something who was a neuroscientist in some way might have gotten a hold of the product and tested it and may have put it through chromatography and may have not found anything that belonged in there organically, like phosphorus, like things weren't. So that's the the other thing that we questioned too, that people who got it, who had like no no sore throat, no headache, nothing. Nothing at all, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, gosh. Because there's a difference, too, between the... Uh, Sorry, I have allergies. Uh, the difference between the Moderna and the Pfizer, because uh, a study was just came out that said uh, when you get one jab, I think it's from Pfizer, your body makes 436 billion copies. Wow. And then it goes different places depending on where it hit. And a lot of it goes to the adrenals. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know it also goes down to the reproductive organs. We've seen it. In autopsies, it's been found in the liver, it's been found in the heart, it's been found on every tissue, it even crossed the blood brain barrier as well. Yeah. Which is, yeah. yeah your brain is expressing, yeah, that's where the headache comes from. Yeah. That's, that's already bleak. Okay. Yeah. I have um, a pathologist friend who's been sharing stuff with me too. Oh, that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's scary to see the answers are up. There. Uh, still births my um so in the in the netherlands once you give birth you get home care uh and uh someone that we spoke to in and around that time who uh is very involved obviously um mentioned that they've had a sudden uptake uh of uptick rather of stillbirths and and miscarriages and all the rest of it so this is something that's been known for a long time at least from from people in the field and people keeping their ears open but uh, with that said what would be your top tips for the listeners of how to keep themselves informed of what's going on and how to just keep aware Twitter. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, the it's the only place evil. you can speak openly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Elon Musk. Thanks yeah. for uh, reactivating all the accounts. So I don't necessarily them. trust him, but he's doing good right now. Yeah. 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 Sometimes uh, that's an argument for intent versus outcome. Yeah. Uh, it, it, like, Fox News has been a great source. He's had people on, and in the past. Um, yeah, my political my views have changed in my politics, but like keeping an eye on things and trying not to uh, confuse um, religion. You, you, you can. I'm not saying religion is bad or being Catholic or Christian. I have my views in politics, but to just stick with science. I, I get messages like, like, what do you think about graphene, or what do you think about chemtrails, or do you think they're liquefying people and spraying them on back on people? Like, I've gotten messages even from podcasts I was supposed to go on who thought aliens had taken over the WEF and were in charge. Keep all that away. Just uh, stick to what you can prove, kind of thing. I don't want to say follow me because I'm not here for likes. I came here for a different whistleblowing thing that we didn't mention today, is which why I joined Twitter was. I was blowed with the federal government and I have a different case going too. just pay attention to the studies and how it relates to your life. Uh, sometimes you can't argue with doctors. I know there's people whose kids can't get into college or, Oh, so here's something. Here's like so, a tip. Here's, here's some advice. Here you go. Here you go. Uh, pause and rewind to take notes. Reli- religious exemption. Religious exemption. I'm unsure what people have been writing down. If they've just been saying that it's not natural or it's uh, the protein is a violation of the Adam and Eve. Yeah. So, so there it is. So yeah. So the the main protein, the main cell line, HEC 293, human embryonic kidney cell 293, that has been used in protein production. Whether it's going to be uh, whichever company or inhaled even. That cell is derived from an immortalized aborted fetal cell line from 1977. There you go. So there's a a thing to write in a religious exemption. Yeah. I guess just keep eyes and ears peeled. Uh, Pick your battles. I have an exemption to the doctor not to get it, but... uh, you know, when someone wants to talk about it, sometimes it's good to just not and walk away. You don't need the stress in your life, even though yep. Twitter can be. I guess just follow certain people on Twitter. Uh, is it okay if I call people out? Uh, By all means. I post, I, I post studies, Christy Grace, I'm Heart of Grace, and it's an underscore, and then Heart of Grace, and then uh, another underscore. 
uh, Jicky, J-I-K-K-Y, Leeks, uh, Jicky the Mouse is well known, who is someone in Australia. But he's posting a bunch of stuff, um, some of the stuff that I quoted today and the files that we looked at that showed, I wouldn't have known about the fragmentation. I know there's a chance of misfold, but you know, Jiggy actually posted the, the actual file from Australia. So like we see different countries going to watch um, Ethical Skeptic. The Ethical Skeptic, he's been pulling data from multiple sources. And again, I, I believe he shared one time his role with the military. And I don't, he was top level, whatever he was doing. So like, if, if you look at him, like he's a literal genius and it's look over your head, but he's posting graphs on from around spring of 2021, where a lot of people talked about where they saw a jump in like everything bad. So he's posting daily graphs to kind of keep people informed about turbo cancers uh, and keeping informed and eyes peeled and not engaging in argument when you don't have to and not trying to have fun still with your life and not make it your life because you can get really sucked down. Yeah, yeah, I didn't sleep for, for days because sure. I was studying you know, reading all like I when I was learning about the LMP, I was like, dear God, like, oh my God. Like I kept reading things where I was like, holy hell. Like, I'm not even a medical doctor. Like I I am finding all this stuff. Why did no one else find it who was in charge of making the shit go? So so I think give it, taking breaks. I don't like the phrase self-care. I like the phrase treat yourself like you would your grandma, unless you hated her. But you know, the <laughs> fingers crossed that's not the thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah. But just Thank a you. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything like we we wanted to talk about? Because I mean, we were we bounced around, and I think we, as far as outcome, I think it's going to stop. Uh, I think they're not going to be able to ignore it, and it's it's just going to take longer than what it should. And then mitigating the harms, um, we have a lot of staff shortages at hospitals. Yeah, those are extra harms that. Um... Like you have in the UK, like it was in London or England where nurses were striking and then That's... people weren't getting the care they needed. Uh, like John, like was it John that like went for like a year and was told it was all in his head. Uh, he's injured and he's been on one of the videos or the movies where he, like he had to pay like so much money to finally get the news that he did have myocarditis for mm. the, the CAT scan. I'm not sure. I haven't come across that story. Uh, it's not John Bow, is it? No. I think this is his last name. Yeah. Him and Alex are in the video together. Okay. Alex has V I T T and lost his leg due to clots. Was this the documentary that uh, there was like a mini documentary? Dunbo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Him yeah. and I are connected. I'm, I'm also helping. Uh, I'm on their emergency call list for there's only so much I can do to listen because of my training in mental health, but I'm also on uh, the UK call list for uh, people who are just having a really rough time because some of my training is in pain management mm. without drugs. Um, yeah, it sucks. It, yeah. it, uh, it freaking sucks. All of this sucks. I've lost yeah. friends and family. I don't know about you and like people watching I've, from like uh... the beginning. Not, not to, I don't want to say to death because I, I do have jab family members that got worse too, but um conflict of inference in, like i had pe i had people from a famous infection infectious disease hospital that i i knew from when i worked at the big company emailing me right away in the beginning of 2020 saying this is going on this is happening this virus is really weak it's got a little capsule now outside just you don't even have to wash your hands like it, it i mean you should anyway but it's like it was a weak thing going around so i wasn't freaking out like i had everybody like calling me like chris you want to die i want to die i'm like no it's not going to happen. <laughs> and then I was like pushing people back saying, oh my gosh, meditate, drink, eat a brownie, like go for a run, whatever, health, healthier, the better. Like we had closed parks. Yeah, yeah. Were parks closed by you too? Like so many people in a house. Yeah. 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 Four people in a house <laughs> and your neighbors <laughs> will be grassing you up. I think it's just basic stuff, right? Huh. When you ask, what can you do? Don't be alone. Connect with somebody. Don't argue with your doctor unless you have to. Try not to. Medical care is, is like under, like threat under of pressure. collapse. Yeah. yeah. Like bring them in snacks or something. Fuck. Like I am. I'm wow. serious. I'm bringing treats to the nurses and doctors. Like even if like that's that's uh that is under such strain in the U.S. right now too. It makes a makes a lot of difference. It does in little gestures. But Christy. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, my gosh, you went to really appreciate it. 
Um, and uh, yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch, you said your handle on Twitter is underscore heart of grace underscore, right? right. And then you've also got your sub stack. Uh, recombinant reflections. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.